Hello, my name is Natalie Toth. I am the Chief Fossil Preparator here at the museum. And preparator might be a word that some of you may have never heard before. So my job as a preparator it has two parts to it. The first part is I go out into the field with teams of staff, volunteers, and interns, and we look for vertebrate fossils and collect them and bring them back here to the museum. And the second part of my job is everything that happens to those fossils thereafter. So the cleaning, repairing, preparing, and getting these fossils ready for research, exhibition, and education. So I thought today we could talk a little bit about some of the really cool opportunities I've had working at this museum um, and really just working as a preparator in general. And kind of going through the process of how do we actually get these fossils out of the ground from most of the time the middle of absolutely nowhere and back here inside the walls of this museum. So we'll talk about that a little bit today. All right. So at the very highest level, 30,000 foot level, one of the first things that we can do is uh, identify what types of rocks and what age of rocks we're most interested in. So one of the areas that I've had the opportunity to do a lot of field work in is Utah. And up on the screen here, this is a geologic map of the state of Utah. And all the different colors that are on this map represent the ge different geologic rock units across the state. And if we're thinking about dinosaur fossils in particular, um, we're really thinking about fossils that are from Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous age rocks. And what's really neat, oh, okay. <laughs> what's really neat about that is that if we look at the state of Utah and we look at the colors of geology that correspond with those three time periods of rock, there's a lot of different shades of green that are on this map. So the potential for yielding fossils of the appropriate age from the age of reptiles, the Mesozoic era, is really high. Something else we think a lot about is ground cover. So um, even though there may be Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous age rocks in different areas, if the ground cover looks like this, it's going to be really challenging to find those fossils, right? Really highly vegetated. You can think of like down by the Mississippi Bayou, right? But really, really difficult to find fossils down there. Instead, we're really interested in areas that look like this. Limited vegetation and lots of lots of exposure of rock. So this is the Hell Creek and the Fox Hills Formation. Um, or areas like this, where um, this is a person for scale. And everything that is underneath of that person's feet is all rocks of late Cretaceous age. And you know it's just hundreds of meters of exposure that have the potential to yield fossils. Something else we think about are, are these fossils the right type of rock? Right, so um, we can have rocks of the appropriate age, but if they're igneous rocks, so those rocks formed by cooled lava or cooled magma, or metamorphic rocks, which are oftentimes way too old to have any type of fossils in them, um, sometimes invertebrate fossils can be found in metamorphic rocks, but most of the time you're not gonna find uh, a vertebrate fossil in these things. Uh, these are fossils, that are, sorry, rocks that have been altered by heat and pressure over tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. So oftentimes, we're not really interested in finding dinosaurs in these types of rocks. But rather, um, I guess I should say one exception to this rule is if you guys have heard of ash fall fossil beds in Nebraska, um, it's this incredible site of all these fossil rhinos and camels and horses that were walking around in North America. And a volcano went off and asphyxiated all of these animals. They choked on the volcanic ash and were buried almost instantly thereafter. And as a result of that, they were covered in this really, really fine green ash. And it preserved their bodies exquisitely in this really amazing fossil site in Nebraska. So yes, technically, a volcanic rock can have fossils in it. But oftentimes, that's not what we're out uh, looking for when we're thinking of fossils. We're looking for rocks that look a lot more like this. So if you've ever driven around in the Four Corners area out in southern Utah, um, even different parts of Colorado, where you're familiar with these beautiful layers of all these sedimentary rocks, and sedimentary rocks being those types of rocks that are made of pieces and parts of other rocks. So you can think about your sandstones, your mudstones, your siltstones. These are all the types of rocks that we're interested in finding fossils in. All right, so we go down our list, right? We have rocks of the appropriate age, the appropriate type, and the appropriate, I guess, kind of rock being a sandstone, a mudstone, et cetera. Um, and we have really great exposure. The next thing that we have to think about as paleontologists is actually getting to where these fossils could be. 
So um, I'm going to go through just a few of the challenges that we experience when we're out in the field collecting some of these things. So this is a site that I worked at when I was at the Utah Museum of Natural History. And uh, there's a long-necked dinosaur quarry at the top of this ridge, uh, many ridges up actually. And there's a, you know, arguably one of the oldest long-necked dinosaurs in North America is found at this quarry. And you can see to access the quarry, we had to set up a series of rope climbing ropes and belaying systems and everything to not only get the people up to the site, but also get all of the equipment that we needed up to the site to excavate the fossils with us. So sometimes access, most of the time access, is really, really challenging uh, when we're getting to fossil sites. Something else that we uh, think deeply about when we're out in the field are different weather patterns. And so they make for these really beautiful skylines when we're out facilitating field work, but it's also something that we have to keep very close eye on when we're out in the field. Um, I'm gonna play this video. I don't wanna like jump scare anyone in case this <laughs> does have sound. Um, I'm gonna see if it works. Oh. <laughs> Oh, dang. Okay, well, I don't know if I can get this video to play. We'll try it. We'll try it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sound jump scare. Oh, 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 we're trying. We're trying. We're trying. Okay. Um, anyways, this is an awesome video of a flash flood, and there's a huge tree that goes by. Um, we'll see if we can do it one more time. Okay, great. So this is a flash flood. You can see it's not actively raining where I am right here, but it's raining somewhere else in the monument where we're doing field work. And when this video stops, you'll be able to see that's the road on the other side that we need to get to in order to get to where our camp is set up, which is at the top of this ridge line here. So again, we're oftentimes always thinking about different types of weather when we're out. Let's try this again. Perfect. Um, I love this photo. <laughs> this, is a, this is a camp you would think we would have learned after years and years of going to back to the site. Um, Salvador and I have spent many field seasons here camping in this exact same location, and I don't know why we keep doing this. Um, so the truck is parked here, and the road <laughs> to cross the wash is down here, and our camp is set up you know, where you guys are sitting here in the audience. And so if you're stuck on the other side of this because you went prospecting or you had to get something out of the truck, um, you might have to wait a few hours to eat dinner that night and until all the water goes down. And then of course, you know, we run into all of these different types of weather features when we're out. This is a huge hailstorm that we experienced out in Casey, Wyoming in the middle of July. Um, oh shoot, this is another video. We'll try it, we'll try it, sorry. Um, jump scare sound, let's see if it'll, okay, no sound, very choppy. Anyways, this is a sandstorm uh, that we experienced. We were out in New Mexico a couple of years ago, which was something new that I hadn't experienced before, but I imagine it would be feel similar to like walking across the Sahara Desert and just being pelted with giant pieces of sand blowing through the air. Um, Uh, of course, we get the freak snowstorms in the middle of field season two. Our field season, you know, runs from like May to the end of October. I think this was at the very end of May in New Mexico, where you go to bed and it's 75 degrees and sunny out, and then you wake up with your tent fly free, three inches from the top of your face because there's a foot of snow on top of your tent. Um, and then sometimes even just the sheer remoteness of where something is can make it difficult to access, right? So this is one of our field sites that we used to have down in New Mexico. And this area is just covered in this really soft, loose sand. And you can't drive a field truck across. I mean, you could, but it would get stuck in this. And so, you know, you're trying to find these really strategic places to park the field vehicle so you can walk across these places by foot. Uh, and the same is true with field work that we do in really intense, dramatic terrain, too. So this is a picture down in Grand Staircase, Escalante National Monument, down in southern Utah. And you can see that, you know, so all of these knife ridges that are in this picture are all of these late Cretaceous rocks that have yielded scores of vertebrate fossils over the last several decades. Um, but actually getting into where all these fossils come from can be really, really challenging. And so one of the ways that we've kind of overcome these challenges is using the help of helicopters. And so we, we've run these big camps out in the back country and we'll bring everything that we need with us down from DMNS. So if you guys have seen the big white box trailer that's parked in the parking lot um, during field season that is full of every single thing that we need to live off the grid and in the back country for weeks at a time. So all of our gear, equipment, food, water, tools, everything we need goes into this trailer goes out here to the staging area, and then it gets set up for the helicopter to come pick up. And sometimes we get sent a helicopter that's able to lift 
700 pounds. Other times we get sent a helicopter that's able to lift 4,000 pounds. And we build these nets out accordingly. And then the helicopter comes and it scoops up all of our gear and the tech hooks everything up. And then there's something quite unsettling about seeing everything that you brought <laughs> being <laughs> carried into the back country, <laughs> into uh, the abyss and just hoping it makes it to the correct GPS location. And something else I will say about that is, you know, everyone, most folks in this room have probably used a GPS at some point or another. And oftentimes there's an error margin, right? It's plus or minus three meters. And when you're thinking about a topographic map or you're thinking about the backcountry, if I give a GPS point to the helicopter pilot, three meters can mean on one side of a knife ridge or the other. And so there have been moments where Salvador and I have had to go out and prospect for things like our coolers or <laughs> go find where did our camp chairs land. And so um, it's kind of this fun game of hide and seek for all of your field gear. All right, so we've, all of our stuff flies away into the backcountry, and then we have to think about, okay, how the heck are we gonna get our field crew into these areas? And the easiest way would be to fly in the helicopter with the gear. Um, however, you know, I've been doing field work in this capacity for about 15 years, and through all these different lifts, I think I've been able to fly in the helicopter twice, and most of the time that's just because of weight restrictions where, or space, right, where the helicopter that we get sent has enough room for the pilot and the tech and no one else. And so we have to think about how we're gonna actually drive into some of these places. Um, and that means, you know, taking, taking tours on these kind of un, unmaintained roads into the backcountry. And we run into a lot of, you know, wo local wildlife. Um, we see some very cute local wildlife and then some very spooky local wildlife too, uh, but still really cool to see these things while we're out. Um, and of course, as we're driving into the back country, we run into all of these different issues. Troy, if you're here, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and every, this is, Salvador and I have become proficient in changing flat tires. Uh, you know, and everybody always has one spare tire, but you almost never have two. And so this is, uh, I love the look on my intern's face. <laughs> She's, you know, this is exactly how we were all feeling in this moment. Um, you know, tires get shredded, vehicles get, it can get a little tricky to drive into some areas. And these are all really extreme examples. You know, most of the time, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, everything's fine. <laughs> Um, you know, even situations where you think that you are the best driver and the road looks safe, um, sometimes things like this can happen. Don't worry, this is a photo from when I worked at the Utah Museum. This wasn't here. Um, <laughs> but, and what's really crazy about this is we were able to drive away after this. I feel, you know, our team was able to fill in this huge crevasse with, you know, stones and branches and boulders and everything we could find in the landscape. We were actually able to drive away. So it was a success story. Um, anyways, okay, so all of that being said, right, these are all just dramatic examples of things that can happen. Uh, most of the time, this is what happens. You get out to where your camp is supposed to be, all of your gear is right exactly where you expect it to be, and we get to unpacking everything, and then we set up our camp. And our camp looks a lot like this. So this big tent here, this is our kitchen tent where we prepare all of our meals, family style. Um, our tent in the back there is where we keep all of our field gear, so plaster and concrete saws and things that we don't really want to get wet in different uh, weather elements, like we talked about earlier. Um, and this is camp life, and this is our field family for the next several weeks, whether you like it or not. So, um, And I, you know, camp life is really fun, right, where we all get to work together, we all make breakfast together, we all make dinner together, we cook our hot meals together, and it's really just an awesome time to get to know a bunch about folks that you don't usually, I don't know, get to sit down and have a chat with every day. So this is two of our past interns, Sadie, now staff, um, and Michaela making Sadie pancakes. <laughs> all right, so you get into camp, you get everything set up, you get your field packs all ready to go, lunches are packed, and then it's time to do the fun stuff, go out and find fossils. So oftentimes when we're out walking around in these areas, we'll find things that look like this. So this is the caudal or tail vertebrae from a meat-eating dinosaur. Um, or things that look like this. So beautiful tooth from a meat-eating dinosaur. And these are little things that we call grab and go, right? You're gonna <laughs> see these on the surface, take down all the, all the relevant information, GPS coordinates, what's the, the rock type and the geology like in the area, who's collecting it, when was it collect collected, wrap it up in some toilet paper, put it in a Ziploc bag with the tag, throw it in your pack, keep walking around, carry on your way. Grab and go. 
Uh, the next type of fossil you might find is something that's just like an isolated chunk of something, right? Where you might have to dig around the fossil a little bit to expose it, but it's not a situation where you have the hand bone connected to the arm bone. It might just be an isolated piece of something, but it's still cool enough that you want to bring it back to the museum. It's still interesting. And so you'll work to build a little pedestal around where this fossil is. Um, you'll cover it in a layer of toilet paper. And then we start to use these plaster impregnated bandages called gypsonas, which you see Caroline holding here. And they come out on the big roll, just like if you were to break your arm or your leg and go to the doctor. Same type of thing that they use at the doctor's office. We just make it into this nice little bundle and you're able to do the same process, record the data, throw it in your backpack, get ready to go. Other times we find things that look like this. Um, we spend a lot of time collecting microvertebrates, so things that are at the feet of all these big dinosaurs walking around in the ecosystem. Um, what's really cool is we'll find these things lying on a big kind of pavement when we're out prospecting. So uh, in this handful of fossils alone, there's probably five different types of creatures just in one palm full of stuff. And so it's really important that we collect these things um, and so that can look a lot like spending a lot of time on our bellies and picking up all of these individual isolated fossils. Other times, if a site is super rich and we don't want to pick up everything, we might just collect all the dirt from the site in a big garbage bag. And I'll talk more about that in just a sec. Other times you'll find um, bad fossils like this or you'll find pieces of bone that look like this. And while this is all just shredded bone on the surface, like I wouldn't necessarily stop and pick up all these pieces, this is a great indicator that something cool or potentially interesting could be nearby. So oftentimes you'll find a huge pile of weather or eroded bone, kind of the base of a cliff or the base of a butte, and that can lead you to things that look like this. And this is the situation where you do have the shin bone connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone connected to the hip bone. And as you start to uncover this, um, you have to start thinking about, okay, it's not just an isolated element, there's multiple things here. How are we going to start exposing, collecting, and bringing this thing back to the museum? And that means taking everything that you need to open up a quarry with you on your back when you're out in the back country. So if you're out prospecting three miles from camp and you find a dinosaur skeleton three miles from camp, you're carrying everything you need to excavate the dinosaur three miles on your back. And I think, um, most of the time, maybe, or maybe not at this museum so much, but you know, other folks that I talk to about field work may think of it as like a Jurassic Park situation where you're using a brush to scrape away the kitty litter from the raptor claw. And oftentimes, um, paleontology and opening quarries looks a lot more like this, where we're using really big, aggressive tools until we're within a few inches of where the bone is actually coming out. So pickaxes, shovels, um, all different types of tools to really get down to the bone layer. What is really neat is that sometimes when we're working on these fossils, we'll uncover other things in the quarry that we didn't know were there. So here are some really beautiful examples of leaf fossils that we've uncovered at some of our sites in the past. Um, and once we're down to the bone layer, we can get into using these kind of smaller, more delicate tools, so scalpels, brushes. This is the Jurassic Park moment, right, where you get to spend a few minutes brushing the dirt away off the surface of these really beautiful fossils using really like, delicate tools. Um, I've worked in a lot of quarries where the rock isn't quite so soft, and we've had to use things like crack hammers and chisels to get the fossils out of the ground. This is a fish quarry down in southern Utah and late Triassic rocks. Um, sometimes we have to use gas-powered tools, so big concrete saws to actually get access to what we want to take out of the ground. And then if the rock is super duper hard, we have to use big jackhammers. Um, Evan's using a jackhammer hooked up to a gas power generator. When we're out in other parts of the backcountry, we actually have a gas powered uh, jackhammer that we pour the gas into, very heavy. Um, one other thing that we do while we're out in the field is we map all the fossils in place of where they're coming from in the quarry. You think about when we start collecting fossils and kind of taking them out of their original context, it's more or less impossible to put them back exactly where they came from once they're removed from the ground. And the way that we keep track of where these things came from is using this meter grid system. So this is a meter square. It's divided into 10 centimeter increments. You can see Sadie's holding our little mapping board here. Um, I think the next picture I have, yeah. So Mike is holding what the paper looks like. It's an exact replica of where uh, this grid is in the quarry. And then we use a plumb bob to measure the north, south, east, and west, the different shape of where this bone is coming from. And then we plot it onto uh, different 
grids and we kind of mash them all together. And so what's really neat is that, you know, you can see these different kind of blobs and shapes of things as you're drawing them in the quarry. But what's really neat is not when you just have a few of these meter grids to together. If you actually have a whole bunch of the meter grids together, then you can really start to get a better understanding of what was going on when these dinosaurs or animals were buried in the ground. And so you can make observations about different relationships between the different critters, different parts of the body, where you may have an articulated series of vertebrae that actually continue next to uh, the, into the grid next to it. And you may not have been aware of that if you're returning to a field site for multiple years after a time. So mapping's pretty cool once you put all the pieces together. Okay, so then it's time to think about, great, we found a big dinosaur, how are we gonna get this back to DMNS? So this is Salvador, and he is sitting in front of a beautifully articulated dinosaur tail. And all of these little pieces that you see here are all pieces of vertebrae. So we're looking at this kind of dino, this chunk of the tail, and rather than pluck each of these individual vertebrae out of the ground and throw them in my backpack and walk them back to camp, it's probably better for science if I leave all of these things together in one piece. And so, um, I guess, spoiler alert, we did that. And this is what it looked like in the lab just a few weeks ago. Really, really beautiful. OK, so we have this dinosaur a skeleton laying across the landscape. We have to think about how can we break this dinosaur skeleton or butcher it up into manageable size pieces. So again, here's our little dino for reference. And as we're thinking about this, we th I think about, OK, you know, we have this dinosaur's tail, where might be a natural break? Okay, maybe where the tail meets the hips, or where the hips attach onto the legs, or the foot attaches onto the full leg, or et cetera, et cetera. And so you can see we've started to kind of divide up the skeleton into different chunks and pieces. We then um, will start to cover these in different uh, in paper towels so that the plaster doesn't actually stick onto the surface of the fossils. And then we cover that paper towel with layers of burlap that are dunked into plaster goo and apply that over the surface of the fossil. And we rinse repeat this process again and again and again until we have enough layers of supportive plaster and burlap that are covering the entire surface of the fossil. Then we start to undercut the fossil. Um, oh, and I love this picture. So we had to divide this particular quarry skeleton into multiple jackets. And sometimes that division can be, I'm not kidding, this is almost about an inch of clearance between these two chunks of uh, where this fossil's coming out of the ground. So we start to undercut and we start to get uh, these big giant field jackets on a mushroom stem. And we work our way inward, removing all of the rock. Once the mushroom stem is just scary enough where you think it's gonna fall over, you crack it with a chisel and you grab everybody that you have on your field crew and do one, two, three, push. And you hope that the whole thing flops over and all of the fossils are contained inside. You work down to scrape off all the mud from the surface of the field jacket. You continue to entomb it in these different uh, plastered or burlap strips of plaster. And you rinse repeat this process throughout the entire quarry until everything is covered with multiple layers of burlap and is coated and entombed on both sides. If your field jacket is small enough, um, so like 100 pounds or less, you can oftentimes put it in your backpack, um, sometimes in very creative ways, <laughs> um, and carry it back to camp, right? And this is, you know, this is uh, Will, and he's got it kind of strapped in on his back. Is it comfortable? No. But is it, you know, the most efficient way? Sure. Um, for what we, we're doing the best we can with what we got, you know? <laughs> Um, I talked about those bags of dirt that we might collect from microsites. So this is kind of what this looks like, where we have these big, big plastic garbage bags or feed bags full of matrix from these really productive microsites of crocodiles and turtles and fish and et cetera. Um, you know, Salvador's backpack is like bursting at the hinges, and we're all carrying, you know, 100 pounds of dirt in our bag that we will ultimately screen wash back here at the museum and then work to pick out all the little vertebrate fossils from. Oh, this is great. This is Sadie in action, throwing one of these big garbage bags down the hill to someone. Um, I'd say this is one of the more common ways that we get fossils out of the backcountry is by carrying them on a body board, just like you would if somebody, you know, broke their leg or something when you're out somewhere. Um, and, you know, as a reminder, things tend to be found in areas that, you know, look like this, where, you know, this is pretty nice. It's nice and flat right here, but if your dinosaur fossil is up here on the top of the butte, you have to get pretty creative about how you're gonna get this thing on a bodyboard off the top of the butte. 
Um, so things can happen that look like this where you're using different <laughs> straps and uh, tools and whatnot to get these things off the top of the butte. And then, you know, the sense of relief that comes with walking it to the back of the field truck. I love, this is one of our interns, Luke. And I, just when I was making this, I was like, wow, he looks so elated to just be done carrying this 300 pound beast. <laughs> um, and then sometimes fossils are even too heavy for Salvador to carry. And so in those instances, we have to use the help of helicopters again. So all of those nets that we flew all of our gear, our gear into the backcountry with come in handy because we're able to carry out dinosaur fossils using those same nets. So this field jacket that Mike is standing in front of uh, probably weighs two or 3,000 pounds. So we'll kind of cinch all the edges of the net together and you know, give the GPS coordinates to the helicopter pilot, hope the pilot can find us, and then uh, he, we hook it up here and it flies away and it'll drop it off to an area where we have our field trucks parked on the back of a truck or the back of a trailer and then we drive it back to the museum. Okay, once it's here in this building, um, I call Nicole or Kristen and say, hey, can you help me unload this 4,000 pound field jacket? And they're like, yes, sounds great. Um, it goes into this jacket storage area. Uh, this is an area called the Annex that we have. I think some folks in this room have probably been in there. It's right behind the coffee lab. But if you haven't been back there, this is what it looks like in there. It's just full of a bunch of big white blobs. When we're ready to work on these different fossils, we'll use a big saw and cut the top of the jacket off and expose those fossils that are on the inside of the jacket. And again, in this Jurassic Park moment, you know, if the rock is really soft, you can use these nice little dental tools like what Sadie has here. Um, other times, most of the time, we have to use tools like this, what's in the foreground. So this is an air scribe. It runs on compressed air uh, that comes from a big air compressor up on the roof of the building. Otherwise, we're using things that hopefully look familiar to everyone, um, toothbrushes and scalpels and whatnot to clean all the mud off the surface of the fossil. Oh, and glue. We use a lot of glue. You will not find anyone in this museum more passionate about glue than you will the people in the paleo lab. Or maybe the folks in Casey's lab, if Casey's here. But <laughs> um, So we use a type of glue that's called paraloid. And paraloid are little tiny plastic beads that look like this. And they are dissolved in acetone or nail polish remover. And we uh, dissolve them at different concentrations. So some, some of these glue bottles are full of really thick glue. Other glue is full of really thin stuff. And that permeates through the surface of the fossil. And it essentially strengthens it from the inside out. The acetone will evaporate and leave all these tiny particles of plastic behind on the inside of the bone. And it makes the fossils nice and strong so that we can pick them up and manipulate it and keep little chunks of fossils together without compromising the fossil. Um, we also use something called Paleo Bond a lot, which is basically just dinosaur bones, super glue. And that's for gluing two chunks of bone together uh, to make sure that they never come apart again. So once all the dirt is scraped off the surface of the fossil, and this process can take a few days, up to a few months, up to a few years, um, they get put in these beautiful archival cradles. And the reason for this is it not only protects the fossil, but it allows us to kind of present things in an anatomical way, which I think is more interesting and exciting than having an isolated you know, shin bone and a toe bone. If you can put those two things together uh, and make it look like an actual dinosaur foot, I think that's pretty nice. One other thing that happens once fossils come to the, you know, they make their way through the prep lab, they then go down into our collection space. And all fossils, when they come out of the field, are assigned a very special number. And this number is tied back to all the data that we collected about this fossil that's on the little tag that, goes, uh, that was made at the time of discovery. And what's even cooler is that, you know, Kristen and Nicole and, you know, folks that go visit their team down in the basement, we can have a request from a visiting researcher anywhere in the world. And they might say, I want to study all of the long-necked long dinosaur toes that you have in collections and they can go into a database and type in long neck dinosaur toe, and it'll bring up a laundry list of all of those fossils that we have here at DMNS, and where they were found, and what rock unit they're from, and all of that information starts out in the field, and they're all recorded on these little tiny tags that we make, or that you know volunteers, interns, whomever make when we're out collecting these bones. Uh, one of the other really cool projects that we've been working on Oh goodness, sorry, last video and then I'll stop. Um, are these really cool 3D surface scans. And so 
Evan has been working with a team of volunteers and interns to surface scan a bunch of long neck dinosaur fossils. And if you've ever had the opportunity to look at a long neck dinosaur, you know that they are not small. And so being able to surface scan them and observe them in a three-dimensional way is really, really handy, especially for dinosaurs that are so incredibly heavy and gigantic. And so this is an ongoing project. Um, anybody can go on to Morphosaurus or Sketchfab and look up these really cool scans we've been working on. And the last thing that we do kind of as our prep team here in the museum is molding and casting. And so we're able to make exact replicas of fossils that can then be used for exhibition, education, or research. So Salvador here is holding the upper arm bone of the Thornton Taurosaurus. But what's really neat is that if our curators get a call from somebody that's in Sweden and they want a turtle skull, we can make an exact replica of that turtle skull and mail it to them and also possibly give them a 3D surface scan of that turtle skull. And now it's almost, almost as good as coming to see the real thing. Okay, I'm almost done. This is the last, uh, last things I'll wrap up with. So, you know, I have all of these kind of stories of the trials and tribulations of going out and getting stuck in the mud and these hailstorms and flat tires and what have you. Um, and that's not to, you know, say, oh, woe is me, look at all this work. Um, the reason that we continue to facilitate all of this really cool backcountry research is because it's, uh, you know, pro it's producing really, really exciting things for science. So all the dinosaurs that are here on this slide are collected from southern Utah. They were completely unknown to science before these expeditions into southern Utah in Grand Staircase. And then even more locally, close to home, these fossils that we find down in Colorado Springs, and while Colorado Springs may not be the most remote backcountry area that we collect fossils from, we use all of these exact same principles as when we're in the backcountry, as when we're in an area like Corral Bluffs to collect vertebrate fossils. Um, and to continue to build up our amazing record of all of these really, really cool uh, vertebrate fossils we have in our collection that are producing really, really cool results in scientific research. Uh, the last thing I'll say about working in the fossil lab is that, you know, I, I did not go, you can't go to school to learn how to be a fossil preparator, right? You can learn kind of the basics of it, but I learned how to do what I know how to do from someone else that taught me how to do it and someone that taught that guy how to do it. And so the work that we do is very much experiential learning in the, you can't um, read a textbook or watch a PowerPoint about how to do field work. You have to actually just go and do it. And we're really fortunate to work with an amazing team of interns and volunteers uh, and be able to share all this cool work with them through, uh, you know, an experience or kind of training program that is something that's super unique to DMNS and we're one of the big institutions out there that's doing this kind of work. All right, and this is my very last thing is that I do not do this in a vacuum, right? All of the folks that I work with in the lab and in our department, um, I can't go out and collect giant dinosaur bones alone. And so all the folks that are here from our staff members to our interns and volunteers, they're able to help us facilitate all this amazing research and make all these really cool discoveries. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sorry that was a little long. Okay, thanks. Time for questions. I'm sure you have dinosaur questions. <laughs> Natalie, a question that I get from guests a lot of times is uh, Tiny the Taurosaurus coming back. I say I don't know. I would like to know that answer too. <laughs> um, I don't think there are any plans to have Tiny come back out from hiding, so. Hi, Natalie. You mentioned a lot of work in Southern Utah. Um, is that work in cooperation or collaboration with like a park service or a national monument? What does that logistically look like? Yeah, so the work down there that we've done in the past is through Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And we do partner with other institutions like the University of Utah or the Natural History Museum of Utah is one of our big collaborators on that project. Um, and that just looks like, you know, getting the permits to go and dig in this really special landscape and everything. Um, 
you know, if you're out walking around in the park and you find a dinosaur fossil, you can't just put it in your backpack, right? You should have a permit and talk to some folks that kind of know a little bit more about that, so. Hello, Natalie. Could you uh, speak a little bit about the logistic challenges of the urban wildlife that you find, I mean urban paleontology that you encounter? What, what, what kind of, um, obviously you're not helicoptering in, but there must be some other kind of challenges. Oh my goodness, uh, there's so many, right? Um, and to be transparent, I'm giving a lecture on this exact topic later in the fall, so probably November, December. <laughs> so come back, hear more about fossils from Denver. Um, it is a whole different set of logistical challenges in terms of you're working, just as you know, Jeff, in snow mass, right? There's bulldozers driving by within just a couple feet of where you're working at, you know, making sure that the crew that you're out there is aware of what dinosaur bone looks like so that they can keep their eyes peeled too. Uh, but honestly, it's been pretty great collecting fossils in Metro Denver because there's none of this like carry them out on a bodyboard or put stuff in your backpack. They just scoop things up with the traco and load it into the truck for us. So it's a nice bonus of being out there. But different beast for sure. Um, question on how do you protect yourself uh, with the acetone glue uh, operation from the acetone itself? Yeah, just when we're using it every day in the lab? Yes. Yeah, so a lot of times it's as simple as just wearing gloves or having on kind of some type of protective barrier. Um, but we do it at such a reduced concentration uh, and we're getting it on us so infrequently most of the time it's all just making its way onto the fossil. So there's not a ton of interaction, but it's just having some kind of barrier, usually just gloves. Steve just asked that because we spill alcohol in my lab all the time. Yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> we're not questions? alone. No other questions? Thank Natalie for a really Thanks. fascinating talk. Thank you.